Hello, welcome everyone once again. We are going to start the plenary session. The education of the future is today. You all know Maria Nieves Tapia. I will just quickly, briefly read from her resume, which is extensive, but it's always good to remember and share with you all. Maria Nieves Tapia is founder and director of Service Learning Latin American Center, CLIS. Between 1997 and 2009, she initiated and coordinated national programs of service learning at the Argentinian Ministry of Education between 1997 and 2010. She is a history professor and founding member of the International Association of Researchers in Service Learning. She has been invited to give conferences in universities and organizations in five continents. She has participated in juries of numerous national and international education awards, such as the Presidential Prize, Solidarity Schools in Argentina, and the International McJanet Prize for Social Commitment at University. In 2009, she was appointed as a member of the Academy for Community Engagement Scholarship Access. She is author of numerous books and articles in several languages, among which we can point out learning and solidarity in education systems and youth organizations and social commitment in higher education curricula. Thank you, Andres. Uh, good morning to all of you. We've uh, met yesterday and the day before. But for those of you who have just arrived, uh, welcome. For us, this seminar, it's two uh, days of party, of meetings, of making new friends. As Jorge was saying, it is really nice to sharing with people who share our same concerns, the concerns for a better education, for solidarity, and for building a better world. For those of you who are here for the first time, we will make a short summary of what we are talking about when we speak about service learning. All of us in education know that uh, talking about project-based education is trendy. Well, for over 26 years, we have been talking about a solidarity-based uh, learning. This is related to all the good things of projects-based education, but these are not projects that remain in the classroom or in the school, that are not a diagnosis of uh, foreign issues, but they work together with the community. Really, this is a pedagogical movement that has existed for many years. Some friends believe that I invented service learning, but that's not true. In Latin America, it has existed for over 100 years, as well as in other parts of the world. Those who have baptized the project were two North American professors I was in primary school, so I had nothing to do with it. But this pedagogy of service learning has a centennial tradition. And today, UNESCO, in its last uh, mega document of all the specialists of the world, talking about what should the education be for the future, UNESCO says that the education for the future has three pedagogies that have to be included in schools and higher education, project-based education, participatory research, and service learning. And UNESCO speaks about service learning 
as education for the future. And I see some familiar faces here that have been implementing these types of projects. Maybe they invented service learning even before that there was literature, that there were experts, that there were, there were congresses on it. So that's why that's the name of my presentation. Here we are all preparing education for the future. And we have been doing education for the future for many years. Many people implement service learning and they call it differently. Uh, yesterday in the researchers' seminar there were presentations from social educational pro practices from the University of Buenos Aires and Tandil and we identified over 30 national universities that have mandatory courses on service learning, but they have different names. They have, they're called community practices, in, uh, comprehensive practices. But in the end, uh, the way we identify a service learning project is when it includes these three characteristics. If there is a clear solidarity action with the protagonism of young people, it's not uh, volunteers, teacher volunteers. Here, young people are the protagonists. And the third element is that it is coordinated with the learnings. So what we offer the community is not just food, but what we do is we share what we know, what we learn at school, the community learns, and it returns to the classroom. And we try to transform the reality with everything that has been learned. Sometimes we have mentioned that if we Google solidarity or volunteering activities in Google, the first thing that comes up is these hands and hearts, this image that you can see there. And as my daughter would say, this is can be the symbol of a nerdy volunteer uh, structure, and this means volunteers that have lots of hearts, uh, that perhaps they really work, but these are hard without a mind. They are good intentions without critical thinking. They are just good intentions without the necessary science. Whereas when we talk about service learning, we are talking about involving the heart and the mind, but also uh, the hands. So it's an educational project. We want to develop critical thinking in our students. We want them to interpret reality, to understand what we need, we want them to listen to the community, we want them to understand their realities. And this is based on listening and to that thoughtful actions that, of course, need the heart and hands. Petalosi in the 18th century said that uh, head, heart, and hands had to be included. And this was also said by Pope Francis. But this is what service learning does right from the beginning. And as we like to implement practice, I would like to conclude this with a concrete case. This is a school in Belgrano, in the north of the city of Buenos Aires. And this is one of the three schools in the city that is specialized in uh, optics. They are, when they graduate, they are technicians in optics. And uh, they're optical technicians. And for several years, the city government, when we had a different minister, uh, they had identified that many children in elementary schools failed in their first grade because they couldn't 
see the blackboard clearly because their families hadn't detected that they had that they were short-sighted and they didn't even have the resources to buy the glasses so the first service learning program that where this school participated is using its knowledge in order to provide glasses for the children from these schools. And this project was so motivating for students that the school ended up, as part of its project, a, a charitable a opti optician where a students work as if they were professionals. They have a counter where they receive patients, they receive prescriptions, neighbors from public hospitals, and from community offices, they receive the prescription, they test the glasses, and then this is uh, you worked in the uh, uh, workshops. Uh, students recycle for perhaps uh, also uh, frames of glasses to uh, manufacture the new ones, and they they. I don't know, they produce or manufacture the glasses, they give them to the patients, and people have their new glasses. So in this experience, at the same time, there's a professional practice that is uh, more concrete and uh, to the point than a workshop, for example. I was a professor of a technical school, and my students at that time uh, couldn't even form their maquettes. Uh, they were falling, and they were being dismantled. So they only passed the subject. But these classes really have beneficiaries, and they have to be perfect for a 10. So this implies a quality education, and it also includes a contribution to the community. So why is service learning an educational quality tool? because we need to know a lot more in order to modify something that is very small rather than it to pass an exam. We all know that an exam, you can cheat or you can, I don't know, perhaps the professor uh, evaluates the things that you have studied only. But in this case, everything has to work perfectly especially in our Latin American experiences and in some others in other parts of the world, we are experiencing how service learning is powerful as a tool for inclusion because nobody is too small or too poor or too special or too vulnerable or whatever so as not to of being able to offer something to others. Here you can see teenagers with Down syndrome that in their gardening workshop help the parks of the city of Buenos Aires. And they have developed a program where these children advise, provide advice to a f former drug addicts and to community organizations so that they can have organic kitchen gardens. They give away plants for families to have a kitchen gardens. These are like the godfathers of the parks. They are not the poor children. They are those who really help to uh, contribute to a better quality of life to their neighbor. And they are children with Down syndrome. Uh, in Argentina and Uruguay, uh, we've seen uh, schools in prisons where prisoners can serve their community, even from prisons. And all of them are candidates for uh, service learning projects. And finally, service learning, we know, is a concrete and effective way of teaching for citizenship. I, I, in the past, we had to learn the, by heart the preamble of the Constitution. And this was a, th a theory. There was a, a military government. So that's what we learned. But 
we believe that citizenship is learned from our discourses. And actually, citizenship is a practice that is learned by doing. And in that regard, service learning makes children uh, capable of playing in the field, in the reality. And we are very proud because many service learning projects are being implemented together with municipalities, uh, implemented uh, in collaboration with state agencies to improve the community. There are several reasons why we can say service learning is the education of the future and it's an educational innovation. I wanted uh, to mention this, which is key. The UNESCO document says that service learning let's say, softens the walls of the classroom. This is a nice metaphor, but we know that it's a lot more than that. It goes through them, it trespasses the walls, and creates a different bond with the community. It's different from the traditional bond that we have with the community. There, I tried to express two very similar models. The one mentioned by Father Gustavo as this a tower, ivory tower that comes from isolation where scientists were segregated from the rest. But in school, sometimes we are kind of in a bubble. I've had directors that if our children were fighting outside the school, they considered that it was not our responsibility. They didn't care what children did outside school. So these very narrow-minded ideas of what the educational community is comes from the 19th century. But underneath, you can see the image of this school uh, canteen. And unfortunately, in many countries, the school is the place where children go to eat. Uh, and it's the only, school is the only sign of the present of the state. And even in moments of crisis, the most important thing that school has to do is to feed children. So this is not the case. I mean, we, this is the other extreme. We are so overwhelmed by the realities in our communities that the clear educational role is blurred. We don't want a bubble, but we don't want to be a soup kitchen. But we don't want to be either. This image is from a book from the 60s where school builds bridges towards the community. We are considered ourselves an island, and we consider that reality is on the other side of the river. So this is a step ahead, of course. But there is an image that I liked a lot, published by an editor in a newspaper, that he was publishing an experience of service learning in Argentina. And when seeing this experience, this illustrator made this image of an education institution that is rooted in the community. And this is what service learning produces. It helps us uh, root ourselves in our communities. And we are considered as part of our community fabric, where we are working hand in hand with our institutions, with state agencies, with religious, cultural, economical institutions. I can see the professor of Mar del Plata there. He gave me once uh, a painting, uh, and it was a, a great painting. And even though uh, you, I mean, perhaps uh, service learning projects are not on their own. Schools don't work on their own. Universities don't work on their own. 
And this is innovation. The walls of the classroom not only soft are softened. The community is the place where we participate, but it's also a place where we learn. Yesterday, in the researchers' seminar, it was great to see scientists of advanced maths, algebra, and statistics who working with communities. They had designed a questionnaire based on what they had discussed with people from the community. So if the university uh, understands that they have to learn from the community, we at the schools are not the only owners of knowledge. We have a lot to learn from the literature. And this is what service learning is about. The rector also mentioned that many of our children have fragmented families. Our children and adolescents are seeking for models for people with whom they can identify for themselves for the future. And this is not only for teachers, but it's also by community leaders. And in this regard, another great innovation of service learning is exactly the role of educators. This somehow represents the podium and the traditional format of university schools. Uh, professors were standing from up high. Professors uh, had all the knowledge and conveyed that knowledge to its, uh, his students. But actually, we not only got down from the rostrum, from the podium, but we also work together and we motivate not only by what we say, but also by our example. Uh, because uh, when we implement solidarity projects, we work in the communities together with the children. And we are facilitators and uh, rather than protagonists. In the educational role, we are kind of histrionic and we are kind of the ones who believe that knows it all. But actually, in the service learning projects, we have to move away and we have to let children move aside and we have to allow children to be the protagonist. This doesn't mean uh, leaving them alone, but it means uh, supporting them, being facilitators, but not doing things for them. And uh, another important information is that service learning helps us uh, partner with our other uh, teachers because reality is not within the framework of the disciplines. And when we are immersed in reality, we find that uh, Algebra 3 cannot solve all the problems, but it needs people from social sciences. And social scientists and exact scientists working together is one of the miracles of service learning, such as uh, the miracle that happens in schools where all teachers get together uh, for one same uh, project. A couple of years ago, there was a program in Uruguay where we carried out a survey to teachers. One of the teachers said something that was quite graphical. He said, service learning helped us uh, walk away from our uh, bowls of rice. And that was a wonderful image of how service learning helps us generate teams working together with other teams, with other teachers, with the librarian, with the janitor who opens the gates on Saturdays, with the entire community.
to change reality together. I wrote, or I took that photo on purpose. This is the crop teacher. He's been helping for a couple of years in reforesting the national park in Patagonia after the fires, the wildfires that devastated native forests. And I love those images of teachers carrying the backpacks for students. Those that planted seedlings were students, and teachers are trying to help them with their backpacks so that they can go to the hills and plant those tree varieties. I love that because we are the ones that uh, put knowledge on their backpacks, knowledge, competencies, confidence, trust, but then they carry it on their back, on their own, and they go off for it. This document, if you do not have it, well, the presentation will be on the web, and you can always look for it, search and download it, reimagining our future together, a new social contract for education. What does UNESCO say after the pandemic? And this is the only diagnosis slide I will be showing. UNESCO begins by saying what we all know, the current status of humankind and the planet is, scare, um, is scary if you bring together photos of all um, havocs and they are scary. But UNESCO considers that in view of these devastating scenarios, you can be stagnated and there's many people that are overwhelmed by reality. They really don't know where to flee. To, there's many that find solace in identifying the enemies, setting the blame on someone, and this um, outrage among people. All this cannot be blamed on me. It has to be blamed on somebody else. And then there's finally the third way to go, suggested by UNESCO, as a path to go to find out a solution to social problems and to put education on wheels for the future. Reimagining the future together demands from pedagogy that will promote cooperation and solidarity. Part of something that we believe believe makes common sense is none of the big problems of humanity, global warming or social fragmentations cannot be solved by any of us individually. Individualism would sound reasonable in the 19th century, but at this point in time, in the 21st century, thinking that individual effort by itself uh, to change reality is naive, to say the least. We need to learn to cooperate, to work together. This was stated by the first person in charge of UNESCO. And this document goes back on track with this. We need to learn solidarity and behave as such. And as any big document from big specialists, it says wonderful things, but real life teachers may think that this is kind of too much to ask. We require participatory, collaborative learning to find a solution to problems in an interdisciplinary, intergenerational, and intercultural manner. That's, what's interesting is that this document is suggesting horizons ahead, but it also gives practical advice on how to do so, because using the old format of lessons to be delivered, I then present a class, write down, uh, take note, let's have a synoptical chart, and I'll test you. That doesn't work anymore. This is where it says that the three paths for teaching in the future are educational approaches that are based on problems and projects 
participatory investigation and pedagogy that are committed to community and service learning. Last year, we celebrated our 20th anniversary as CLIS, and it was the first time that they mentioned us. So I'd like to thank them for this. Let's now come down to the core uh, of my presentation and let's see how we are faring time-wise. We'll be done shortly. UNESCO says one of the purposes of sustainable development considered by United Nations is that students should be global citizens requiring knowledge and competences to build a sustainable future in an increasingly interdependent world. That definition, what I like about this definition, is that it does not just show the ideal case scenario. We have to have knowledge and competence in place to know how to go about it, because we all have wonderful intentions. We all mm, know how to draw the nice garden for the planet, for the Earth day, or for the planet's day, but then we need to know how to go about finding a solution to poverty problems or to uh, the problems that have to do with planet Earth. And along these lines, and this is a mainstream issue for the entire seminar, um, UNESCO says that Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs themselves, can be the curriculum for future education. They may structure interdisciplinary learning based on problems and projects that will help students develop their skills and competencies to make progress in the entire array of projects. This being a prospective goal, but we are doing it already. For the last three years, the Ibero-American Network published a book written by two Spanish colleagues on SDGs and service learning. And truth be told, if you take a look at all these goals, you have it handy in your um, material, so I won't take long in analyzing each one of the 17 goals, but we know that behind them, there's down-to-earth service learning experiences. Some um, have existed before SDGs by United Nations. So in this seminar, and this is why we will devote the entire afternoon tomorrow, is to share what we've been sharing so far, structuring service learning projects around SDGs. And for that, we chose the structure that has happened in United Nations, goals around people, around the planet, around prosperity, peace, and uh, the alliances of associations, and you will then hear what is the dynamic that we invented around SDGs and take an active participation in these sessions. SDGs, as can be seen, do not just encompass the environmental or the social arenas. They take action around this concept that is becoming mainstream, integral ecology. I borrowed the definition from Laudato, uh, see, uh, document by the Pope, but many environmentalist associations are taking. They say that such an ecology is a comprehensive way to approach issues where simultaneously we fight poverty and at the same time as we try to take care of nature. At times we thought that ecology meant saving whales or cleaning uh, penguins from oil. That was partly part of it, but environmental problems affect us all today, and they affect especially the most vulnerable populations, so social and environmental components, when it comes to that, are one single reality. 
We've seen this happen in service learning projects, how this has been done. People approach at the same time social and environmental issues, schools that are being built or self-built. Uh, well, in Uruguay, Montevideo, they teach construction techniques to winners in Montevideo so that they can have a worthy home. And so they teach people knowledge, but at the same time, they aim at reducing poverty. African students that train university leaders and community leaders on new technologies to engage in e-trade so that they can generate new sources of development. Work is being done simultaneously on very many SDG goals. Work can be done for SDGs at the kindergarten as children uh, do it at the maternal in, uh, infantile uh, center, at the daycare center in Sao Paulo. This can be done in high schools, as is the case in this public high school on um, this village that was on the list of villages going extinct because everybody would migrate from it, but they recovered it. It is part of the touristic circuit of the province. And now this school is oriented to tourism down to university, where many of them are carrying out uh, projects, high-impact projects for life quality, as is the case with these students who are um, Louvain, uh, students from the University of Louvain and from Kinasha in Congo, where students work together in improving the educational and urban infrastructure of a rural community. And if we now move on to the last part, everything is nice, but we have to be self-critical. We have to know that not just any service learning project can contribute to sustainable development. Sometimes these are small projects that are starting, and we do whatever we can do. That's just fine. But then we need to aim higher. You know, the media are full of five solutions to lose weight in just a week. Well, I'll give you five solutions for you to realize that they won't be effective in just a week's time, but they might come in handy for you to think and rethink your projects. The first one, how important planning is. Mm, the rector one today talked about what they had done to institutionalize service learning, planning. Last year, we distributed that manual that can be freely downloaded from the web. There's stages to this. They are suggested they can be adapted to your own project, but you don't need to reinvent the wheel or come down with something that has existed for long as if it were new. This journey that we suggest to plan a project is based on the experience of many of us. There's steps that have to be fulfilled. We sometimes feel tempted to say, well, I had this idea, and then you would go and parachute it on the community. This is the first motivation when it comes to carrying out the project. We need to take time to carry out good diagnosis of a participatory nature, to hear from community and find out what they need, design and plan who will take care of what. All these things that may sound a little bit more boring, but they are part of the service and learning that our kids have to do. You cannot change the world at a click. Most people just think that it's enough by clicking on a course or liking a course and that's done. That's not the case. Modifying reality requires effort and planning, and this is something we need to get going with it. And those that are in charge of projects, we need to be part of the planning, and we need to realize that we have to focus on our efforts. We cannot be dispersed 
juggling 20 different goals in 20 different places. We need to know who we'll be working with, who our allies will be, and to also know what is the duration and the intensity of the project and our work so that it pays off. Sometimes there's projects that require long years and we need to plan for many generations of students that will be working on projects like this. And there's others where we might get started and finish a project shortly. The second thing, and I don't think that we can ever emphasize this enough. Projects on service learning are not good to not train citizens if we do not reflect on practice. Uh, John Dewey would say that we don't learn from experience. We learn from reflecting upon our experience. And when it comes to that, we know that when we reflect, we need to plan to challenge things. It's not a matter of saying, oh, it was so beautiful. That's not enough. We need to go down to the depths of it and ask uncomfortable questions. Uh, this reflection by the Ministry of Planning in Argentina on service learning. They focused on political and socio-economic context, values and rights. It's not just group dynamics and how well we fare with one another, but how much we learned and how do we assess how much we learned. I could keep discussing about this the entire morning, but I'll give you some recommendations showing tools uh, that will help <coughs> uh, what we've done with uh, the Uruguay Ministry and a website from the Chilean Catholic University that focuses on reflection, that has a lot of very interesting material, and I encourage you to read this. The third one, and this may sound that it's just for universities, but it goes for schools as well, <coughs> in having an impact on sustainable development, <coughs> we need to research, we need to investigate. First graders need to learn <coughs> how, <coughs> how to grow saplings, and university students need to carry out research to transform reality. In researching to solve is more interesting than investigating to describe, but what we need is solutions, and this is the type of research that we need. In order to be really charitable, we need to be rigorous in our investigations. Uh, yesterday in the research seminar, we were glad to see that there was an increase in rigorous research or investigations. And I hope that nobody gets offended by what I'm going to say. I think that this is more urgent than ever uh, to stress a scientific method in these times of anti-science and anti vaccines in these times where organizations with the best ranking universities have associations that believe that the planet is flat and that the earth is flat and that nobody ever reached the moon. In these times of anti-science and fake news, it is more urgent than ever to educate our children, our adolescents, our youngsters in scientific thinking scientific thinking, and we have to connect scientific thinking to the transformation of reality. Science is not just an opinion. A critical and rigorous thinking is not an opinion. So in that regard, service learning needs to be strict, because like we said, the heart is very doing well, but we don't have to forget about our mind. All service learning projects should have this sticker of SDG 17 because everything is done through alliances or partnerships. Somebody wrote school alone shouldn't and can't and those who do service learning know that we need to build networks and we not just need to tolerate diversity but to appreciate and we need to learn from each one. And the last item 
is, and going back to the beginning, is that we need citizens that are very well educated. Sometimes we're wondering what planet we will leave to our children. As educators, we have to wonder what citizens we will be giving to our planet. Yesterday, the one representative from the LEO brought statistics about the young people who don't believe in democracy. In this country, recovering democracy was uh, really hard. We are celebrating fourth, 40th anniversary, and it's still unbelievable for us, but our adolescents are losing their faith in democracy because they don't see it working. And in that regard, we all have to recover this dimension of citizenship in our projects in order to give importance to critical thinking, to living together, and the importance of working towards a common good. Some projects might be specific to citizenship such as the children from Bariloche consider that they who were able to make the municipality approve uh, uh, some laws by a citizen. I mean that citizens who are 16 year olds can present bills, but all the projects should include a citizen dimension in each step of the way, including what motivates us as regards common good, as regards the responsibility of the state regarding the problems. It's not the role of the school to handle all the problems. The state has to play a role what information we need from public agencies, what support we need, what we'll be requesting from them. So reflection has to be regarding the citizen dimension and focused on all our projects. Many of foreigners know this cartoon character, is a national cartoon character, let's say, Mafalda. She was an elementary school girl, and when the teacher asked her colleague a word starting with P, she says, maybe he says that bad word, and she's actually thinking on another word. And her friend said politics, and she said, well, he actually said it. Sometimes we are afraid of the political dimension. And this doesn't mean that service learning projects have to be based on political parties, but they have to embrace the political dimension as a search for the common good. And we do not have to be afraid of political problems or a dialogue with political authorities. There is a phrase from Margaret Mead and I would like to end with this phrase, is that you, you never have to doubt that a small group of thoughtful and committed citizens can change the world because actually they are the only ones who have done so. And if I think about the group of to these 12 fishermen and others uh, with Jesus in Palestine, and if I think about the group of young students from the Cochabamba University who lit the first spark of the independence revolutions in South America, these have always been small groups of committed people, engaged people, those who have produced changes. Here we are 450. We can be very few compared to the problems of the world, but we are the tip of the iceberg uh, for many others. So we know that we know how the education of the future is done, and we are making it present, and we are sharing it. Thank you very much. to continue the discussion. All these glasses have to be perfect. 
Uh, we have to know more and better service learning projects, promote a better and knowledge, but not less knowledge. The citizenship is a practice that is learned by doing. Citizenship is a practice that is learned by doing. How can we, how we can work with others? Service learning projects are focused on teamwork. The new formats, the challenge of softening the world, walls, but also the changing the way in which the learning and teaching processes change, facilitate for them to grow and to be protagonists. If you write some questions, give them to the people standing on the corridors in the room. So we invite you to ask questions. We need to teach critical thinking and scientific thinking networks and the political and prophetical aspects of service learning. Nieves, uh, I will ask you a question while we receive questions from the audience. What is the connection between experience and politics and politics and experiences? And what's the role of the institutionalization and all SDGs and the curricula? Could you tell us something about that? Yes. In the room, there are several people who are a university authorities or school leaders. There are some public servants, too. And thus, we also have this debate whether things have to grow in a, a top-down or bottom-up manner. And our experience in service learn tells us that both things should occur at the same time. Sometimes there are countries where service learning has been growing slowly from the experiences in high schools or universities. And as from that university experience, sorry, leaders decide to support them. In other countries, this has come from politics. There's a move, there was a movement in the US, but suddenly a law gave them resources for over a decade for these uh, policies. Institutions uh, experience the same. When we talk about, when we talk with teachers, they say, oh, I would like my director to support, to support me more. And when we give courses to directors or principals, they say, I don't know how to motivate my teachers. Actually, we need to reach an agreement, and we need to start where we can start. My advice is, if we have to start, and if you're just a teacher or a librarian, well, we know experience that experiences that have started because librarians read these projects and proposed a project, and then it started growing. There are schools uh, in where, where the principal such as Andy Furco, he received the last, uh, say, the latest trend, and it was a service learning. He loved it, and well, that's why he's here. So let, no matter where it starts, the thing. The important thing is that it should start. The second step is that there should be a critical mass. We should stop being the only crazy people doing these things. We have to convince others. We have to convince partners and community members. And once we have this critical mass, we can start thinking of making it part of the culture of the institution. In some schools, they've been doing service learning for 35 years. They have 35 years. They have changed principles. Some teachers have retired. But anyway, there is service learning because there's part of it's part of the identity of the school. Some uni we universities need politics. We need guidelines that are part of the identity of the institution that are regulated so that they are not things that just depend on the goodwill of the teachers or of the rectors. So we have some questions. Yes, we're receiving questions, and we want more. So we invite you to ask. 
One question from Colombia. Since it's education for the future, what stronger relationship can we establish between innovation and service learning? And the other question is, how can we speak about schools that are not bridges? This, uh, this is from Uruguay. This is a question from Africa. How can we achieve the SDG goals working with the community and the classrooms, articulating educators and students? Well, I will connect the first question to the question of the school that is not a bridge. I won't explain what inertia means, but I know that by inertia we keep on doing things as things were done in the past, as things were taught in the past, as they have always been done. As the, and the most difficult part is to break this inertia. When we innovate is when we dare to stop and say, we've, we've come so far, and that momentum is stopped. There are many aspects where service learning is innovative and really uh, breaks with the past or, uh, in terms of student protagonism, in terms of the co connection with the community. Of course, there are many schools where they still conceive or perceive as the educational community as a community that perhaps includes the families, but the educational community is just the educators. And that very narrow-minded idea is totally against what we believe. And we have to be patient because the very deep changes, changes that affect culture, do not occur as quickly as the technological changes. I'm old. Uh, I, we were studying from teachers who said that in history there are short times, midterm times, and long term times. The short times are those for the ministers of economy in Argentina. An example of midterm times is the situation like the drought or rainfall or floods. Well, those are the midterm times or periods. But there are things that only change in long term periods such as the way in which we bury the dead, the way in which we take care of our senior uh, or elderly, or the way in we learn. These are things that change in long-term times. And we have to be patient, because once again, we have to be faithful in what a small group of teachers can do to transform their reality. Thank you. We have more questions. Uh, there's one from Africa that I did not answer. Yes, about SDGs and the, the connection with the community. Well, thank you for this question. I think it's from an African student. I think that especially university students have to be careful when they enter a community because development is not imposed on the communities. Development is built together with the communities. And talking about inertia, especially universities have had a tradition of arriving in the communities without listening enough and without respecting 
or autochthonous knowledge and popular knowledge. So there, we, there's a need for a dialogue. And it's good that university stu students are trained uh, on how to dialogue so that they can uh, exercise their professions in dialogue with their people. This is a very long question, but includes several things. It's from Chile. From, from uh, how can we convince a teacher of maths who are against of active technologies to work on a literacy project of legal vocabulary for a, a community? Well, we don't have to be prejudiced against maths teachers. Yesterday, and I recommend you all, we will publish all the papers from the researchers seminar. One of the papers selected yesterday was exactly related to the maths studies where mathematicians are implementing service learning. So all the subjects can implement service learning. But anyway, there are two things that we have to consider. The first one is that even though service learning by nature is interdisciplinary, it is not mandatory for all the teachers to participate. Because if that is our first goal, our primary goal, we will be end up fighting with lots of people. So my advice is, first, we have to be patient and we have to respect each one's times. And for the children teacher, well, I will mention the experience of a, of a small town in Ramona, in Santa Fe province. When they celebrated their 15th year, they came to the seminar. The biology teacher who had started the project uh, taking care of the water and considering uh, arsenic poisoning. And the last teacher who had joined the project 15 years later, who was a maths teacher, who had joined the project exactly to teach statistics to their children in order to do these statistics and analyze the results of the project. And I loved the intellectual honesty of this maths teacher who said, I was seeing Raquel running up and down with the children, uh, going to the hospital and the municipality, and he said, oh, this girl would end up uh, collapsing. Why is she getting tr this trouble? But then I started seeing that students loved Raquel, that they were standing a lot for her subject, that they were having good results, and I started being jealous. And in the end, I end up joining the project, and I'm very pleased of implementing service learning. I'm summarizing the situation, but that was the story. So be patient to your math with your maths teacher. We have a question. It's time for one more question. So on how to motivate teachers and how to get resources and for the projects. And several questions related to the tension between competences, standardized proof, rigorous studies. Well, let's talk about the first part. When we designed the roadmap for the first time, we hadn't included motivation initially. And then we realized that it's the key element. How to motivate is essential. We have a short time, so I will say two things. Nobody is motivated if they don't know it. So it is important to disseminate the proposal, to make it known, to share the literature, to propose experiences, to share uh, stories. Now you will return and you will tell them that the seminar was nice, that you heard this and that, and uh, you will share what 
people do in Africa or in rural areas. So we have to share these stories because, at least in my experience, first of all, as a teacher and also as a promoter of service learning, teachers are saturated. We are saturated with theories and with experts telling us that we are doing everything wrong and that we have to start from scratch. There's this tiredness that can be understand and that is understandable. So the only thing that persuades teacher is when others te other teachers have done and what they are doing mm, well the first time. So when I see that the next door school that has the same problems as I do, who have the same budget as I do, and who have as many difficulties, but that are carrying out other projects that encourage students, this is where I get motivated. If you've done so, I can do it myself. So we need to generate this healthy emulation. We need to suggest experiences that that can be inspiring for others. And we need to disclose um, this. That's for starters. Another important thing is we are in Latin America. We know that if you live in a country with big donors where the ministry gives you lots of resources, well, uh, that's good for you. But there's no one from Finland, so we can talk about the rest. Other things that our teacher and that our children need to know is that the world doesn't get changed for free. It requires efforts and resources. Even though it's only four pesos that you need to purchase the house to water the plants or to buy uh, school items for school support. Yesterday, in a more reduced group, we would say, at least so in Latin America, uh, the fact that if you have not sold a food, whether empanadas or pastries, or if you haven't participated in a kermes, then you are not Argentinian. We've all been there. We've all had to find money for doing this. And that that can be an opportunity of learning in itself because you need to learn to manage resources, to write a quote, to know how much is needed and what not. And then we need to give space to developing creativity. I remember one of the first few experiences where I learned a lot. Uh, the winner of Solidarity um, in Argentina was a technical school from Mendoza who contacted a teenager that had been left without mobility because of a car accident. He needed a wheelchair. His family could not buy it from him and for him. And having to think that you would have to stay at home without going anywhere would be short of a nightmare. So they decided to build a wheelchair. They went to take a peep at the orthopedic house locally. These were German um, wheels. They had a panel and fine wheels. And kids came up with a wheelchair that would work with, you know, mountain bike wheels, those that are quite inexpensive. Rather than a panel, they fitted it with a computer joystick. And with just a few pesos they got from donors, they purchased materials and they built the wheelchair. There are schools that go to the car cemetery to, to find uh, metals, to find windmills, to lay down in Patagonia and have energy. Creativity helps people find lots of resources. And organizing, fundraising is very necessary. This needn't be done by teachers on their own. This is also part of what students need and have to do. Of course, as is the case with the national program of solidary education, then we can have awards and rewards, and then we can engage in projects. Well, if that is the case, we will 
great Thank people. You so much. Thank you so much. So that the Chileans don't take it badly from me. Two final remarks in connection to the last question. From research, from cases and from experiences, we've seen that there is no reason why there should be any contradiction between approving standardized tests and being solidary. 25 years now, a very good research that was carried out in the United States of the first few years of service learning in um, Central America showed that students carrying out service learning would get better scores even in standardized tests. And students that would come from the most vulnerable sectors would score better results than their peers. And this is no magic. This is the experience that we have. Students told us yesterday, statistics students, that in the course they've given them an option. They would either do service learning or they would sit for an exam. 80% decided to go for service learning. 20% 20 of them decided to sit for the exam, but their scores were worse. And it was far more difficult for them to understand the rationale of the activity than those that had engaged in service learning who had experienced statistical principles in practice. You don't have to be afraid of service learning. Uh, just because we are good buddies, we will be less serious. That is not the case. We do have to be serious and be careful with the element of learning in service learning. Thank you.